Life is a box of chocolates fullest. You never know what you're gonna get. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down 100 examples of the Mandela effect. Scotty, beam me up. For this list, we're taking a deep dive into the strangest instances of collective false memories, otherwise known as the Mandela effect. These examples are derived from movies, TV shows, sports, history, and basically everything in between. Snoopy's Tale, the Peanuts franchise. Charlie Brown's dog Snoopy is one of the most iconic cartoon characters of the 20th century. Now be a good dog and go home. So one would think every detail of such a memorable character would stand out in people's minds. But when you picture Snoopy's tail, what does it look like? Is it white like the rest of his body, or is it a single black line? Thanks, old pal. As it turns out, his tail has indeed been white since he first appeared in early comic strips and cartoons. But there are those who recall it being black instead. You must think I'm stupid. Oh, come on, Charlie Brown. While it would certainly be easier to draw a single dark line, Snoopy has always rocked a white tail. The Blair Witch Project The Blair Witch Project took found footage horror to the next level, listing its actors as missing or deceased during its marketing campaign. The gimmick was a success, with many moviegoers leaving theaters unsettled by the film's dubious reality. In one of the film's most memorable moments, one of its characters, Heather, looks at the camera and delivers an emotional monologue, saying, I am so... So sorry. However, many instead remember this line as I am so scared. The misconception is perhaps because she goes on to say that she's scared to open or close her eyes. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. It's only compounded by the scary movie parody of the scene. I'm so scared right now. Tweedledee and Tweedledum's Hats, Alice in Wonderland. The bizarre and beautiful Alice in Wonderland has a few Mandela effects to its name as well. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. Most everyone's mad here. As tempting as it was to discuss how the Cheshire Cat never says, we're all mad here, we elected to talk about the wardrobe of two of Wonderland's residents. Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh if you think we're wax wax, you ought to pay, you know. Tweedledee and Tweedledum are two twins who can come off as rather annoying. They also wear very distinctive hats. However, what's on top of those hats is a matter of some debate. While the original footage indicates that the duo wears flags atop their headwear, Plenty of people seem to think that Tweedledee and Tweedledum's hats have propellers on them. Talk about throwing you for a spin. And what good is a computer without hat gadgets? Shaggy's Adam's Apple, the Scooby-Doo franchise. Norville Shaggy Rogers is like the best friend of talking Great Dane Scooby-Doo and part of a gang of mystery solvers. He and every member of the gang have pretty distinctive looks. We all know Shaggy is a tall and lanky fellow with a green shirt, brown bell-bottoms, and a pronounced Adam's apple. The dog nappers have struck again. The third prize dog kidnapped in the last three days. Wow, like a canine crime wave. <sighs> but the last characteristic isn't as intrinsic to his look as you might think. While Shaggy has occasionally been depicted with a very notable one, it's not a consistent part of his design. Now, folks, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. Why so many of us are convinced that an Adam's apple has always been key to drawing him is one mystery we'd love to see the Mystery Inc. gang look into. Well, gang, looks like we have a mystery on our hands. The Flintstones, the Flintstones franchise. You will all vote for either Fred Flintstone or Barney Rubble. The modern Stone Age family from the town of Bedrock has been a cultural touchstone for over half a century. But what their surname is depends on who you ask. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, they're the modern Stone Age family. Over the years, some people have insisted that the Flintstones used to be called the Flintstones. 
This belief persisted even though their theme song repeats the sharp T pronunciation. To be fair, we can see how kids might have dropped the T in Flint because it was easier to say. But maybe there's another explanation. Perhaps the mischievous Great Gazoo changed Fred, Wilma, and Pebbles' last names just to mess with us. Flintstone and Rubble? <laughs> you thought my name was funny. Wasn't Osama bin Laden already dead? We all know how Osama bin Laden died. The 2011 night raid by Navy SEALs on his compound that ended the infamous terrorist's life is well known the world over, and was even the subject of feature films. And yet, there are a large number of people that recall Osama bin Laden being caught and even dying before 2011. But the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. Some remember it being from kidney failure in a hospital, while others believe he died during the 9-11 attacks. Terrorists are known for spreading half-truths and rumors, so it's possible the people are remembering intentionally spread falsehoods. But the widespread nature of the belief is suspicious regardless. Diddy Kong's Quest, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. There's an awful lot of Kongs in this entry's title, so you'd be forgiven for jumbling them up. That seems to be happening to fans of the Super Nintendo's Donkey Kong Country series. The platformers allow players to walk on the knuckles of Donkey Kong and his nephew, Diddy Kong. The latter got his own sequel in 1995, equivocally named Diddy's Conquest. Players were possibly confused by the title, as many still refer to it as Diddy Kong's Quest. Fortunately, gamers remember this highly praised platformer fondly, even if they can't quite agree on what they remember calling it. The Rails of Rainbow Road, Mario Kart 64. We all remember the big three, learning to ride a bike, learning to skate, and finally crossing the Rainbow Road finish line. Even multi-fingered aliens don't have enough digits to count how many times we fell from that kaleidoscope path, specifically on that dastardly N64 version. Except, you never fell off the N64 Rainbow Road, because that Rainbow Road has always had guardrails. Despite many remembering otherwise, rows of protective yellow stars have always outlined the barrier of the Mario Kart 64 final course. Through all its expansion packs and re-releases, the 64 track remains the only iteration with rails from start to finish. I'm a Luigi, number one. No co-op for Heretic or Armory. Halo 2. So we smile. What's that? Well, we still got something to smile about. The Halo franchise is such a behemoth, it might be easy to forget that it all began with Combat Evolved in Halo 2. The groundbreaking shooter sequel commences with two tutorial missions called The Heretic and The Armory, which allows newbies to familiarize themselves with the controls. Many online commenters mentioned that they'd experienced these early missions with friends, siblings, internet ne'er-do-wells, the like. They remember playing split-screen, experiencing glitches, and interacting with NPCs together. In reality, neither Heretic nor Armory ever supported any version of co-op play. The Heretic campaign actually consists entirely of cutscenes, and the Armory is a rare Halo level that is devoid of enemies. Despite finding some easter eggs here, we've yet to unlock any mysterious multiplayer mode. Bingo! As you can see, they recharge a lot faster! Red Robin, Mortal Kombat 2. Fight. Cue the infectious theme music, and you'll be zapped back to the arcade, SNES, or wherever you remember first experiencing Mortal Kombat. The addictive fighting game gave many the opportunity to be any one of an unforgettable cast of characters. However, one of these mega warriors only exists as a figment of our longing imaginations, Red Robin. Gamers might share memories about a version of Reptile who looked fresh from a crimson bath clad in red. In truth, Red Robin was never anything more than a rumored addition to the franchise and was never truly unlockable. Fan-made videos tease his reality, but this juicy burger of a ninja has never been anything more than a myth. Gen 1 and Dual Types – Pokémon Red and Blue Twenty-six years after the debut of Red and Blue, the Pokémon franchise is still pushing us to make good on our promise to catch them all. 
After nine generations and a jump to mobile gaming, the original 150 have received new evolutions, shiny forms, and additional classifications. Wasn't it easier when they were all just one type? Well, perhaps not. Trainers old and new seem convinced that the dual type categorization for Pokémon was invented for later generations. But insert any 90s cartridge into your old Game Boy, and you can still catch a flying slash fire Charizard. Dual type Pokémon have always been there. Mind blown? Here's another one. Psyduck was never actually a psychic type Pokémon. Kill Switch Survival Horror Game. Our bizarre fascination with the macabre seems as collective a phenomenon as the Mandela effect itself, so it's only natural that the two concepts would overlap. When they do, we get urban legends like Kill Switch, a survival point and click horror game involving a creepy coal mine. Those who dared played as either a young girl or a demon in an adventure that definitively erased itself upon completion, leaving behind no trace of its existence in the electronic system. All concrete evidence suggests that this is just a popular creepypasta. Nevertheless, online users continue to trade virtual campfire stories about cryptograms and eerie gameplay with such detail that it feels like more than just a false memory. Erased from existence or banished to a parallel dimension? You decide. King Tut's Mask King Tutankhamun is one of the most famous pharaohs of ancient Egypt, in large part due to the discovery of his tomb and famed death mask. Let your people go? I've never heard such insolence! The Golden Mask is an icon of pop culture, and is the basis for many pop culture depictions of Egyptian iconography. Tarantula, King Tut, Orca, Killer Moth. Except, picture it in your head. What animal is on the forehead? If you guessed a cobra, you'd be correct. But if you said vulture, you'd also be correct. Many pieces of Egyptian artwork and sculpture depict just a cobra on headpieces. So it's understandable that people would forget the vulture is there too. But even so, King Tut's mask is one of the most famous Egyptian artifacts ever. How do so many people miss the bird? Bird, bird, giant eye, pyramid, bird. Mm hmm very good. King Henry VIII's turkey leg painting. Of the kings of England, King Henry VIII is notable for many things. The Protestant Reformation of the English Church, his many wives, and holding a turkey leg in a painting. Except that last one isn't true. I'm Henry VIII, I am. Henry VIII, I am, I am. I've been eating since 6 a.m. Despite what people remember, there is no painting of Henry VIII holding food. There's actually a royal protocol forbidding the official depiction of English royalty while eating. A few paintings do show Henry VIII holding objects that could be mistaken for bird legs, and one film memorably shows the king eating a whole roast chicken. Perhaps these were conflated in our collective memories to create the image. And my name's synonymous with gluttony. I'll always eat a turkey or a hat. The first major politically motivated violent act on U.S. soil. When was the first act of terrorism in United States history? Many people point to 9-11, given how unprecedented it felt. Others cite the World Trade Center bombing in 1993 or Pearl Harbor, but the earliest terrorism was in 1916 on an island off the coast of Liberty Island in New York. A munitions dump was detonated by German agents, creating one of the largest non-nuclear explosions ever recorded. This event is also why the torch of the Statue of Liberty is closed to visitors, because the statue was damaged in the event. It was not widely reported, which may explain why so many are confused, but it doesn't explain why some people remember visiting the Statue of Liberty's torch after 1916. Wow! Governor's Island looks so insignificant from up here. Harry Houdini's death. Houdini has been challenged to liberate himself from a steel straitjacket. Arguably the most famous magician who ever lived, Harry Houdini's death is perhaps less well known. Houdini supposedly could withstand blows to the stomach with preparation, and an unexpected hit to the stomach ruptured his appendix, leading to his death. However, some swear that the magician actually died in an even more dramatic fashion. This particular form of escape has never been attempted by anyone, anywhere. Some recall that the great Houdini died doing a magic trick, his famous one involving being chained underwater in a tank. While a Hollywood movie from the 50s does indeed show Houdini dying in this way, it's fiction, not fact. It's possible people just took the movie at face value. If there's any way, I'll come back. Scary Movie One of the films parodied in the first scary movie is M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense. I see dead people. 
the parody scene references the big twist from the 1999 film, with Marlon Wayans' character telling his friend, I see dead people. I see dead people? <laughs> it's a weak joke, simply repeating the line from The Sixth Sense. Some fans, however, remember the scene differently, believing Wayans said, I see white people, a line that better fits the comedic franchise. Yo, son, it's like I've seen this all before. They had a kill at your old high school, Shorty? Nah, it was in this movie Scream. Same dialogue and everything. Oh. This is ill. There is no evidence that this alternate line ever existed in the film, however. It did exist elsewhere, though. Billy Crystal said it at the Oscars before Scary Movie's release, and it appears in 2002's Undercover Brother. I see white people. It's too much! Too much! Caucasian overload! Caucasian overload! Caucasian overload! Have we jumped realities, or are some fans just mixing up memories? Cruella's last name, 101 Dalmatians. Disney has a huge roster of memorable villains in its animated films. One of these is Cruella, a heartless socialite willing to harm dogs just to create a coat out of their fur. When can the puppies leave their mother? Two weeks? Three weeks? Her motivations are as memorable as her on-the-nose last name. We all remember thinking that her last name, Deville, was spelled D-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but realizing that it was a not-so-subtle way to say, Wait, what's that? Cruella's last name literally is just Devil spelled D-E-V-I-L with a space in the middle? Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil. If she doesn't scare you, no evil thing will. And it's always been that way? Honestly, maybe we thought it was Deville because that's an actual surname and the name of a car. The garage is empty, but there is a Cadillac Deville registered to Patrick Gates. Or maybe something else is afoot. Either way, the DeVille is in the details. Oh, you're going straight to hell for that one! If you build it, they will come. Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams follows Ray, who has a vision of a baseball diamond in his field and of long-dead baseball players playing on it. He also hears voices whispering the words, If you build it, they will come. Except the line is, He will come, not they. We can see how the quote might have gotten misremembered, given that not just one person shows up, there's all the players and the crowds to watch them. He will come. Also, they is a more inclusive and all-purpose pronoun than he. But it also misses the point of the movie, Ray's relationship with his father, who is the he the quote refers to. If you build it, he will come. The Great Pumpkin appears. It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Peanuts has been a part of pop culture for over half a century, and part of its longevity has been through animated specials that get aired nearly every year on TV, like this one. Despite its annual airing, however, some believe this Halloween special used to have a different ending than the one being shown today. Oh, Great Pumpkin, where are you? In the animated film, Charlie Brown's friend Linus insists on the existence of the Great Pumpkin who visits on Halloween. Linus waits up all night for the Great Pumpkin, and falls asleep outside still waiting for him. Except some people remember the Great Pumpkin appearing when Linus falls asleep. Is this memory your Great Pumpkin? And the Great Pumpkin never showed up? Nope. We're gonna need a bigger boat. Jaws. Jaws is an iconic movie, the prototypical blockbuster. As such, you'd think that it would be impossible to get anything wrong about its most famous line. Most people remember Police Chief Brody remarking we're gonna need a bigger boat after catching sight of the monster shark for the first time. But actually, he says you're, not we're. You're gonna need a bigger boat. He even repeats the line a minute later. You're gonna need a bigger boat, right? But when it comes to quoting this line, everyone is sure the line is we're. It makes sense since Brody's aboard the boat too, yet everyone manages to get it wrong. Is the we just more inclusive and versatile or did something devour the truth? Test your Piano Man memory. Inspired by Billy Joel's real life, Piano Man tells the story of a musician playing at a bar and the people he encounters. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. A regular crowd shuffles in. For years, many people sang along to the song thinking the line in the first verse was, Son, can you play me a melody? 
While that may sound right, it only proves that most of us are not talented lyricists. He says, son, can you play me a memory? I'm not really sure how it goes. But Joel is, and his version is much more interesting and thought-provoking. Rather than asking for a melody, the man making love to his tonic and gin asks Billy if he can play him a memory. Just goes to show how much weight a single word can hold. Well, we're all in the mood for a melody, and you got us feeling all right. The guy by the record machine in I Love Rock and Roll. In her 1981 cover of the Arrow song I Love Rock and Roll, Joan Jett opens with a line that is now the source of a lot of confusion. Jet sings about seeing a guy by the record machine, but not a lot of people agree on what said dude is doing there. There are plenty who will swear he's just standing by it, while in truth, the lyrics make it clear that she saw him dancing there by the record machine. I saw him dancing there by the record machine. To be fair, if your memory of the song is via the official music video, then you could be forgiven, since what the guy is doing looks more like the former than the latter. The Barbie World Given the simplicity of the lyrics to Aqua's Barbie Girl, it's probably hard to imagine that you've been getting it wrong all these years. Hiya, Barbie. Hi, Ken. You wanna go for a ride? Sure, Ken. Jump in. But rest assured, at least some of you have been. While singing along to the cheesy, ultra-shimmery chorus, some of us may have been belting out I'm a Barbie Girl in a Barbie World. Well, if you're one of such people, you may be surprised to learn that the song actually refers to the plastic utopia as the Barbie world. This implies that rather than it being one of many, our titular girl inhabits the only Barbie world that exists. Isn't that just fantastic? Come on, Barbie, let's go party. Hot, hot sky, yeah. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. The Rain in I'll Be There For You As the theme song for the cultural giant Friends, many of us heard I'll Be There For You by the Rembrandts almost every week for 10 years. So, no one told you that was gonna be this way. so it's pretty safe to say that we would know the lyrics like the back of our hand, right? Your love life's DOA, stuck in second gear, it's all as much a part of our pop culture lexicon as how you doing and we were on a break! <laughs> But let us ask you one question. In the chorus, is the response to I'll be there for you when the rain starts to fall or when the rain starts to pour? If you said fall, you could not be more wrong. I'll be there for you when the rain starts to fall. You could try, but you would not be successful. Boom Boom Pow's release date. You would think that it wouldn't be such a big deal whether a song was released in 2007 or 2009. But when it comes to Boom Boom Pow by the Black Eyed Peas, it's a big enough issue that there's even a Reddit thread solely focused on that one question because of a particular lyric in the track. In the thread, quite a lot of people claim to remember listening to the track in 2007 even though it wasn't released until March of 2009. Many others were also shocked to learn that said lyric is actually I'm so 3008 instead of 2008. Regardless of what your memories are, can we at least agree that mocking someone by calling them 2000 and late makes more sense in 2009 than in 2007? I pity the fool, the a -team. This 80s classic has a surprising number of Mandela effects attached to it. Murdoch! Here! And crazy! B.A. I pity the fool! While it was tempting to discuss Howling Mad Murdoch being misremembered as Mad Dog Murdoch, or the confusion around the team's van color, we're going with the catchphrase that never was. Mr. T starred in the show as B.A. Baracus. That's for a little boy named Joey. B.A. Bring him out. Many seem to recall the character using the phrase, I pity the fool. And while Mr. T himself is known for this catchphrase, he never used it in arguably his most famous role. I'm calling for a vote. 
I'll say we take a vote on this case. Do you pity the fools who remember this wrongly? Or are you one of us? Uh, them? No, I don't hate Balboa, but I pity the fool. Hi ho, Silver. The Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger! While the Lone Ranger may have been before the time of most of our viewers, and most of us too, the general facts about it have pervaded pop culture. I owe silver! Away! A masked ranger fights for right with his Native American friend Tonto, and he says hi ho silver when he rides his horse. I owe silver! Except that catchphrase may not be the same as most remember it. What he's actually saying is hi yo silver. The difference is subtle, which is probably why so many misremember it. Hi ho silver, away! Plus, hi ho seems way more common than hi yo. Just ask the seven dwarves. Hi ho, hi ho, it's home from work we go. Judy's gavel, Judge Judy. Judge Judith Scheinlin presided over her reality TV show based courtroom for over two decades. Well, I don't have it. You want to get it for me? Um, um it's not an answer, I, I sir. I believe I can. I believe I can. Good. Do. A staple of daytime television, Judge Judy was watched or at least famous among millions of people. But one aspect of her show that reality seems to have ruled against is her use of a gavel. Oxygen. Did you did you hear this? My sister has never done anything for my mother. Did, 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 watch my this. Entire life. I don't want to use it. While it is true that Judy occasionally used one early on during her show's run, and in some promotional photos, by and large throughout her show's time on TV, she didn't use one. So has someone altered reality? Now here's an ad about a fat people disease you have. Or do people just associate a gavel with judges and therefore one of the most famous judges? We'll leave it up to the jury to determine guilt or innocence. Holy relevant phrase, Batman! Batman. <laughs> Let's get one thing clear. Burt Ward's Robin does have a catchphrase where he says holy, insert relevant yet bizarre, in or out of context phrase here. You're not misremembering that. Holy haberdashery! That can't be regulation prison uniform, can it? One half of the Cape Crusaders somehow managed to turn the oddest part of his and Batman's adventures into an exclamation. Holy cinema scope! But one thing all these ridiculous outbursts have in common is that Robin almost never says Batman at the end. He does, rarely, yes, but not usually. Holy bargain basements, Batman! When other people do the gag, it's understandable why they add the Batman. It makes it clear they're doing a reference. Yet, if somehow memories or the world have been changed, we know who'd we call to solve the case. Holy conspiracy. This is a tricky one, all right. Careful. Meta World Peace. What do you think about Ron Artest's choice, or should I say Meta World Peace's choice, <laughs> and what name would you pick for yourself if you were going to go off the deep end and change your name? Ridiculous. It reminds me of Prince. So you know. dumb. This athlete might be one of, if not the most colorful personalities to ever play in the NBA, next to Dennis Rodman, of course. Y'all don't seem excited. I'm all excited. I feel like I'm, I feel like the oddball. Come on. The fact of the matter is, the player formerly known as Ron Artest left his mark in the NBA both through his defensive prowess and several controversies. Now Artest has jumped over the scorer's table and is trying to get down to the bench. Artest is in the stands. One bizarre instance came when he decided to change his name to Meta World Peace in 2011. You know, and Meta is a Buddhist name. You know, you want to keep attaching yourself to as many positive things as possible. You know, when you look at my career, not being a good teammate, like Meta is like the opposite, like be a good friend, be loving, be kindness. I want to communicate, I want to be a better person, you know, and that's pretty much what Meta means. However, today, this is actually no longer his name. Despite keeping his first name, he actually changed it a second time in 2020, and his full name is now Meta Sandiford Artest. However, many people and outlets still refer to him as Meta World Peace, even though that's not his name. Here's to hoping there are no more name changes that would only add to the confusion. I took my wife's last name. So, what is it? So her last name is Sandra for and wait, our wait, test. Wait, 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 wait. I got married. <laughs> Hell no. Yeah. You changed your name again? I got married, now I changed my name. Doc Martens. When it comes to boots, Dr. Martens or Doc Martens are some of the most popular ones around. 
but while their fans may forever be fighting with Timberland's enthusiasts over which is better, there's some disagreement among themselves over how to spell their favorite boots. Many contend that Martins is spelled with an I. However, the boxes and decades of records would seem to suggest that Martins is spelt with an E. Most spell the word Martin with an I, so the mix-up is understandable. Further complicating everything is the fact that their founder's name was Dr. Klaus Martins, spelled with an umlaut. The Toon Squad Jersey Alright, so this might fall under the lines of a Mandela effect in movies, but for the sake of this list and the fact that NBA superstars are involved, we're including it. And now, the player coach of the Toon Squad, at 6'6", six six, from North Carolina, his royal fairness, Michael Jordan! Who? Is he a Looney Tune? In the film, Michael Jordan and several Looney Tunes characters form their basketball team, the Toon Squad, to face the Monstars in a game of basketball. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Some assume or mistakenly remember, thinking that the Toon in Toon Squad is spelled T-O-O-N, but it's actually spelled T-U-N-E. Years later, even prior to the release of the second Space Jam movie, many over social media wondered why the name was spelt that way, believing it to be a mistake, yet no error was ever actually made. Then again, perhaps the only mistake was the decision to make a second movie. Oh. Skechers Another footwear Mandela effect, Skechers are a brand of sneakers known for their distinctive S logo. So what's wrong with Skechers, or at least people's memories of them? It's the name again. To sketch is to draw, and a sketcher is someone who draws. Therefore, it follows that the brand of shoes is just a plural of the latter, right? It, not so much. In fact, there's no T in Skechers. Contrary to one of Skechers' slogans, it's not the S, it's the T. At least according to some folks. Is it just a case of our brains autocorrect being wrong? Ray Bork He is among the greatest defensemen to play in the NHL, but at one point in time, he had yet to win a Stanley Cup. Having played the majority of his career with the Boston Bruins, he was shipped to the Colorado Avalanche in 2000. Soon after joining the team, he was able to finally hoist the Stanley Cup before announcing his retirement. So while there's no debate concerning this scenario, some do not remember it the exact same way. Some remember Bork winning the Stanley Cup the season he was traded to the team. However, that season saw the Avalanche actually lose to the Dallas Stars in the Western Conference Finals. Bork and the team would only actually win the cup the following season against the New Jersey Devils. Regardless of when it happened, Bork came out a winner in the end. 22 years in trying to accomplish that. Incredible story, an incredible feeling, just an incredible relief. The Pillsbury Doughboy's Neckerchief Pillsbury Company is well known for its refrigerated dough products, and their accompanying mascot, Poppin' Fresh, aka the Pillsbury Doughboy. There's something I've wanted to do to you for years. <laughs> <laughs> the iconic mascot is instantly recognizable for his trademark giggle, as well as his white chef's hat and blue neckerchief. Except that last one isn't quite true. Ads dating back years show that the neckerchief is as white as his hat and the rest of his body. Yet so many of us remember Poppin' Fresh having a fresh blue neckerchief, even appearing that way when referenced in several TV shows. Nothing says I love you like something from- Hey, what the hell are you doing, you crazy bitch? Do people simply remember that bit of his wardrobe poppin' more than it does, or is there another explanation? Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. He helped me so much in, in the way that I approach the game the way I play the game. Whenever they speak Michael Jordan, they should speak Scottie Pippen. The Chicago Bulls' dominance and championship victories during the 90s is most often credited to the team's two biggest stars, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. The duo is considered one of the greatest in NBA history, with some going so far as to compare them to Batman and Robin. Their history, their success, and being so frequently associated with one another has often led many to believe that the two must be friends and are naturally very close. However, this isn't the case. Watching you and Michael on the court, it looked like two best friends out there just crushing everybody. What was your relationship like off the court? <laughs> it wasn't what you saw on the court. We always will have that respect for each other, but our friendship is not where people um, see it on TV, think it is. In his memoir, Unguarded, Pippen went into detail stating that while both players respected one another, they were never really close and only hung out together on a few occasions. And after having made several critical comments of Jordan both in his memoir and during interviews, we don't expect a friendship between the two to blossom anytime soon. You call Michael Jordan selfish in the first chapter. Why is that? I mean, uh, he was a great scorer, but a lot of things that he did uh, was based on uh, him as an individual. 
and I think basketball is a team game. Chewbacca's lack of metal. Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. At the end of A New Hope, Leia holds a ceremony awarding Han and Luke medals for their acts of valor. Unfortunately, despite aiding the rebellion just as much as his human counterparts, Chewbacca does not get a medal for his accomplishments. It's a weird oversight, which some remember happening differently. One Reddit post posits that Chewbacca not only got a medal, but that he had to lean over Leia to be able to place it around his neck. This moment never existed in any cut of the film in this reality, but others remembered it happening nonetheless. Interestingly enough, one official comic does offer a similar solution, showing Leia standing on a table to award Chewbacca a medal after the ceremony. Kurt Cobain's Pink Jacket Nirvana was one of the biggest bands of the 90s, and frontman Kurt Cobain was everywhere. Take your time, burn your is just only late. However, what has proven surprisingly elusive is a particular photo of the musician. Some fans remember Cobain wearing a pink jacket with a feathery texture. Images of it supposedly disappeared quite suddenly, with proponents of the idea pointing to an eclipse in 2017 as being the moment it occurred. I deleted the photo. Promise. Some even described experiencing a visual glitch when searching for the image. While images of Cobain in pink jackets can still be found, none have the furry or feathery texture described. This smells like more than just teen spirit. John Denver's Plane Crash Much like our last entry, John Denver is another musician whose life was cut short too soon. The country singer died on October 12, 1997, when the homemade airplane he was flying crashed. This much everyone can agree on. However, the location of where Denver crashed is disputed by some. At the crash site off the coast of Monterey, California, crews have recovered about one quarter of Denver's plane. There are those who remember Denver crashing into a mountain, rather than California's Monterey Bay, as records seem to indicate. Perhaps Denver's funeral being held in Colorado caused some confusion. Or maybe people were thinking of his song, Rocky Mountain High. Rocky Mountain High. Rocky Mountain Richard Simmons' Headband Famous fitness personality Richard Simmons has made frequent appearances on various TV shows, despite a more recent absence from the public eye. I have a tank top for all of you tonight. Yes. Even so, his look is quite distinctive. Frizzy hair, tank top, short shorts, and a headband. Well, except that last one. Or at least, that's what all the evidence is telling us. Here we go. What? Plenty of people remember Simmons sporting a headband. There are even people cosplaying as him with one. But the man himself usually goes for the bare forehead look. Simmons has probably worn a headband at some point, but it's not part of his usual attire. She attacked me, and then she hurled my case spade headband somewhere. Maybe Simmons is just so ingrained with people's ideas of fitness that they assume it must have been a part of his wardrobe. Yep, it's just a headband, that's the whole story, the end. Mike Tyson's ear bite. The rematch between Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield is notorious in the boxing world. Infamously, Tyson bit both of Holyfield's ears. The first time, the fight continued, though Tyson received a two-point deduction. The second time, Tyson took out a chunk of Holyfield's ear, spat it out, and the fight was stopped. Or at least, that's what a lot of viewers remember happening. In actual fact, the first bite was the most severe. After the second, the fight continued for a few seconds rather than stopping immediately. With all the controversy the fight caused, are viewers misremembering the brutality of the moment? Or did something take a bite out of reality and spit out something different? What did you want to do when he did that to you? Bite him back, but I chose not to. Ed McMahon and Publishers Clearinghouse. Okay, this one is legitimately spooky. Ed McMahon is known for quite a few things. You'll be walking away today with a check for $25,000. Oh. $25, he was Johnny Carson's sidekick for decades, and he's also famous for delivering oversized checks to people's doors for the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, right? Ed McMahon, our good friend, could not be here, yeah. but it seems, David, that you are the $1 million winner. Well, not only did McMahon not deliver checks door to door, he was never affiliated with publisher's clearinghouse. Instead, he presented sweepstakes for American family publishers. Yet TV and pop culture associate McMahon going door to door with big checks. So what gives? I'm one of the 
the winners of the publisher's clearinghouse? <laughs> Ed McMahon wants to see me right away? Did everyone just confuse a less famous company for a more popular one? This doesn't feel like winning at all. In the only sweepstakes with my picture. Lazy boy. All right, open your eyes. <laughs> Sweet mother of all that is good and pure. When it comes to recliners, there's one brand name that's practically synonymous with these chairs. Lazy Boy. Everyone can agree on that much. People aren't rushing out to buy hard work mans after all. But the spelling of the iconic chairs has some people sitting up in them rather fast. Many sitting enthusiasts recall Lazy Boy being spelled L-A-Y-Z-Boy. She's got me. Hey! What? How things get here? And that spelling does make sense since you do a lot of laying down in reclining chairs. However, all evidence today suggests that Lazy Boy is spelled without the Y in lay. It's still pronounced the same, you don't la down in them. This is likely the cause of the confusion, but they're popular enough that it's still odd. The Calvin Johnson Catch Former Detroit Lions wide receiver Calvin Johnson has been labeled one of the greatest to ever play the position in the NFL. Arguably his greatest performance was during a game against the Dallas Cowboys in 2013, which saw him go for 329 yards and a touchdown. And here is Stafford's pass to Johnson, touchdown! Because of how spectacularly Megatron played, many frequently believe this highlight reel catch took place during that game. On first down all day for Stafford who goes to the end zone, jump ball, touchdown! Megatron is in for the touchdown, Calvin Johnson. <laughs> that is unbelievable right there. Only that, although that catch happened when the Lions were playing the Cowboys, it actually took place during another game back in 2011. We can understand why one would think this catch happened during the game in 2013, but it is simply not true. Coke Zero. Can you taste that? It's the deliciously, delicious, deliciousness of deliciously delicious Coke. Coca-Cola is one of the most recognizable brands in the world. They've come out with plenty of variations on their classic formula over the years, from diet to cherry to Coke Zero, which has zero sugar. We're not telling you that the last of these doesn't exist, it does, but it's not exactly as some people remember it. The containers of Coke Zero don't read Coke Zero as a lot of Coke drinkers seem to recall. Instead, they're branded as Coca-Cola Zero Sugar or Coca-Cola Zero. It seems obvious that the common abbreviation Coke was simply ingrained in people's memories as being on the bottles and cans, but there isn't a 0% possibility that existence has been rewritten. Cheez-Its. Cheez-It. Cheez-Its are one of the go-to brands for cheese crackers. They're found in nearly every grocery store, but despite how widespread they are, there's something most people get fundamentally wrong about the snack. The name isn't Cheez-Its with a Z at the end, or with an S either, it's just Cheez-It. This one seems fairly self-explanatory. People refer to the individual crackers as the Cheez-It, and the plural of that is Cheez-Its. The extra Z could be just people staying consistent with the rest of the word. Even so, a box of Cheez-It just doesn't sound right. I don't even know who I am anymore! Patrick Steffen and the missed empty net. Steffen steals and he'll ice it! Oh, at least I thought he was gonna, until he blew it! That's unbelievable! Here come the Oilers the other way, and Hemsky's loose! Hemsky, he scores! Can you believe what we just saw? In a 2007 game between the Dallas Stars and Edmonton Oilers, which the latter seemed set to lose in the final seconds after intercepting the puck, Patrick Steffen missed an empty net. Shortly afterwards, the Oilers would reclaim possession of the puck and Alish Hemsky made the most of the opportunity. Many thought this was a great way for the Oilers to finish the season, except it didn't take place during the end of the season. Contrary to popular belief, the game actually took place in January. Not only that, but many also assumed the Oilers wound up eventually winning the game, but they in fact tied the game and went on to lose in a shootout. The unreal sequence loses luster with those facts, now doesn't it? Here we go. Sakura. That'll do it. Etch a sketch. Hey, etch. Draw. Go! Oh, got me again. Etch, you've been working on that draw. If you were born in the last. 60 years or so, chances are that even if you never played with one as a kid, you at least know what an Etch-a-Sketch is. These toys have a distinctive red frame and let you draw lines using knobs on them, which can then be erased when you want to make something new. However, the makers of the toy never drew lines in the name of the toy itself. Etch-a-Sketch is not spelled with dashes. There are full spaces between etch, a, uh, and sketch. So did someone shake up our collective memories and redraw them? Miracle on Ice. 
This victory by the U.S. men's hockey team against the Soviet Union during the 1980 Winter Olympics is not only viewed as one of the country's greatest triumphs in its sports history, but one of the most significant moments in the country's history, period. It transcended the sport. It was a national win for the country. Couldn't have been alive not feel wonderful about it. But to some everyday people, due to the widespread attention that the victory has received, they often make the mistake of assuming that the U.S. captured the gold medal during this game. Only they didn't. In fact, the win allowed them to advance to the final against Finland, who they went on to beat to win gold. More emphasis is often placed on the victory against the Soviet Union due to the fact that they were favorites to win it all. And the U.S. pulled off an upset that no one could have ever anticipated. It made you want to hug your television set. I mean, it was that good because look what they did, how they pulled this off, and everybody felt great. Number 50. Tom Cruise Wearing Sunglasses. Risky Business. If somebody were to wear underwear, a white shirt, and sunglasses while dancing to Old Time Rock and Roll by Bob Seger, what movie do you think they were referencing? Risky Business, obviously. And if you look at the numerous parodies of this scene, that's what you'll see. No, no, you get, get out. Well, I get thought out. it could be fun. No. He said no. However, viewers may be surprised when they revisit the original scene, as not only is Tom Cruise's character not wearing sunglasses at all, but his shirt is practically pink. Music ain't got the same Granted, his character does wear sunglasses everywhere in the movie, but you'd think the shirt color would stick out in our collective memories. With that old -time rock and roll. <laughs> Number 49. Target's Ring Count Target has a very distinct brand for being an all-in-one store. Their logo is fairly memorable too, with their red and white color scheme featuring prominently in advertising campaigns. Still, as famous as its logo is, it misses the mark for some people. Target's… the uh, Target has a red dot with a single red ring around it. However, some people remember the logo having multiple rings. So many rings! And while the logo did have multiple rings in the 1960s, folks recall the logo being different much more recently. Which begs the question, is this a false memory or a bullseye recollection? Nice. Bullseye. Number 48. Tiananmen Square Tank Man the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre are among the most horrifying events in recent Chinese history. Not that the Chinese government will let anyone inside the country talk about them. Tension had been building all day Saturday after some early skirmishes between students and soldiers. But while censorship inside China has led to younger people in China being unaware of the event, people outside are confused about its most striking image, Tank Man. This lone protester stood in front of a line of tanks. According to video and historical records, the unidentified man climbed on top of the tank and later left. But there are those who remember a more tragic outcome. The tank man was run down. Is someone censoring reality, or is it a case of mistaken memories? Number 47. Fonzie's Jacket. Happy Days. Arthur the Fonz Fonzarelli is a pop culture icon. And of course, everyone knows his deal. He's your typical greaser with slicked back hair, a black leather jacket, and he says, Hey! Hey! But many find themselves doing a double take when they look at his jacket now. It's not black, but rather dark brown. Oh boy. You must think I'm pretty stupid. Granted, it is a darker color, so that may account for the discrepancy in people's memories. They might also be conflating the Fonz's look with other famous greaser characters like Danny Zuko from Greece. No matter his wardrobe, though, the Fonz is still the Fonz. I like to warm up a little bit, okay? So I'm gonna be right back as soon as I finish warming up, okay? Just. <laughs> Number 46. Yeah, science, bitch! Breaking Bad. As one of the most acclaimed and popular TV shows of the 21st century so far, Breaking Bad has inspired plenty of catchphrases and memes. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. Jesse Pinkman's famous phrase, yeah, science bitch, is actually one of the latter, although many mistake it for being a catchphrase of his too. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Oh! While Jesse is indeed famous for favoring the derogatory word, he doesn't use it along with his famous line about science. So you do have a plan. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, yeah, science! A famous meme macro has combined Jesse's actual catchphrase with this scene, so it's no wonder people got this one mixed up. 
Number 45, JFK's Car Assassination. U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated during a motorcade in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. It's one of the most famous assassinations in history and certainly one of the most revisited. Hey, Mr. President. Look over here! And then shots rang out. While there are many conspiracy theories regarding the events that day, one of the most bizarre involves the number of people present in the vehicle it occurred in. A lot of people remember there being only four people in the car. However, viewing the footage now will tell you there were six. The Texas governor and his wife in the middle seats are often forgotten, probably because most convertible cars aren't set up with six seats. Shots came from near that wooden fence over there, near the overpass. Number 44, Starbucks Star. Starbucks is arguably the biggest name in coffee. Yeah, there's Dunkin' Donuts and Tim Hortons out there, but Starbucks is the global brand that everyone knows. Hey, Seattle, Space Needle, Starbucks. Or so you would think. Despite the millions of cups likely sold since the start of this video, some Starbucks patrons are surprised about something on its famous logo, the star above the mythological siren's head. Many customers remember the logo having only a crown with no star above it. Well, the siren did indeed lack a star at one point, but that was before its iconic green look. If anyone does decide to devote themselves to this potential mystery, they'll definitely need a lot of caffeine. We're just saying. Hey Lois, I didn't flush. I want you to come see it. Looks like the Starbucks mermaid. Number 43, Saw. Saw is known for its intense torture-based horror. And at the center of it all is a white-faced puppet named Billy. Hello, Amanda. You don't know me, but I know you. I want to play a game. Acting as a way for the antagonist, John Kramer, to communicate with his victims, Billy gives characters the option to subject themselves to excruciating pain or face certain death. These options are referred to as games, but contrary to popular belief, Billy doesn't ask whether his guests want to play. In the original Saw film, Billy never says, do you want to play a game? But instead, I want to play a game. I want to play a game. Here's what happens if you lose. It's a simple change, but one that definitely changes the tone. Hello, Mark, Paul, Amanda, Zep, Adam, Dr. Gordon. I want to play a game. Number 42, Kit Kat Bars. One, two, one, two, three, four. Give me a break, give me a break. Give me a break. Give us a break! Now there's Mandela effects in our candy? Kit Kats are a globally recognized candy bar, with four wafers, usually covered in chocolate, though some countries go nuts with a ton of different flavors. Looking at you, Japan! What's even more nuts is that people can't agree on how to spell Kit Kat. While it's occasionally stylized as being one word, that's not what we're talking about. Rather, there are those who remember there being a dash between Kit and Cat. Are people just splitting the difference between the one and two word spellings, or did someone break off a piece of reality? No, I get it. Number 41, the Chicago White Sox and the World Series. Not only is Chicago a bona fide sports town, but it is also home to several championship teams. The Bulls, the Blackhawks, the Cubs, and the Bears, and the White Sox. For whatever reason, several outlets have had a tendency to think or forget that the Chicago White Sox won the World Series in 2005. Out! And the White Sox have won the World Series! Juan Uribe with a play, charging it, throwing it, and the White Sox celebrate their first title in 88 years. In two separate instances of reporting on championship statistics, ESPN forgot to include the Chicago White Sox. In 2016, the Twitter account of CBS's morning show even shared a false fact about the city not having seen the event in 71 years. Yet in truth, when that tweet was sent, the last time the city saw a World Series was 11 years ago when the aforementioned White Sox played the Houston Astros and won the series. Perhaps we'd understand if they'd never won in 2005, but they did, and it wasn't so long ago, so where's the logic? Number 40, the insert band name here. This one can easily be understood given how people speak when referencing a band. For example, saying the Eagles' best album is Hotel California or Blitzkrieg Bop by the Ramones is a kick-ass song just flows better in conversation. However, the fact remains that neither band has a the in their name. 
Go ahead, pull out your albums, cassettes, and CDs and see for yourself. Welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place. Are you desperate for a real the now? Well, if you flip through your Pink Floyd albums, you'll find one where you might have forgotten a the exists. No, they aren't the Pink Floyd, but their eighth studio album is actually called The Dark Side of the Moon. Confused? Well, so were we. Number 39, Bruce Springsteen, Bandana or Cap? Born in the USA is one of the boss's greatest and most recognizable hits. The cover of the album of the same name famously features Bruce Springsteen's backside in a pair of jeans, with the US flag in front of him. Many fans distinctly remember a bandana stuffed into the back pocket. What's up with the bandana, dude? Huh? But if you look today, it's a baseball cap instead. While baseball caps certainly fit the all-American image, so does a bandana. Wait, hat or no hat? Hat or no hat? And this Mandela effect catches even some hardcore Springsteen fans off guard. Perhaps someone was born to run off with this vanished article of clothing. Number 38, Christopher Reeves. Misremembered names are a frequent Mandela effect. Just look at the host of The Twilight Zone, Rod Sterling. Sorry, we mean Serling. Dang it. But not even being a man of steel makes you immune to these mistakes. Superman actor Christopher Reeve is often mistakenly referred to as Christopher Reeves. Okay, why don't we uh, start with you? You're, um... Uh, Christopher Reeves. Okay, Chris. Reeves is generally a more common surname, and people do frequently refer to a Superman as Christopher Reeves Superman. Is that how a warp brain like yours gets its kicks? Fellow Superman actor George Reeves probably didn't help the confusion. But unless someone somehow took the man's last name up, up, and away from this reality, it's probably just a misremembered name. Everyone stand back, please stand back. It's all right, nothing to get worried about. Number 37, Michael Jackson's White Glove. The King of Pop is famous for donning a single white glove. No, we're not going to tell you he never did that. Of course he did. But ask yourself, which hand did he wear the glove on? there are some who swear that he only wore the glove on his right hand. Likewise, there are some who contend it was only worn on Jackson's left. On the other hand? <laughs> they are both wrong. He wore one on both hands at some point, though never at the same time. So this is what they consider the second generation Michael Jackson glove. It's likely this switching led to confusion among fans. Unless, that is, reality has been hit by, it's been struck by, a smooth criminal. You've been hit by You've been hit by a smooth criminal. Number 36, Jackie Robinson. This baseball legend is most often recognized as being the player who broke the color barrier in baseball, a sport that was predominantly segregated. I don't pretend to be an expert on communism or any other kind of politicalism, but you can put me down as being an expert on a, being a colored American. And while this is indeed true, this groundbreaking achievement has often led people to believe that Jackie Robinson was the first African American to ever play professional baseball, period. At 30, he was universally regarded not only as the first black in the majors, but as a great player. But the first player to actually do this was Moses Fleetwood Walker. On May 1st, 1884, Walker made history when he suited up for the Toledo Blue Stockings in a game against the Washington Nationals. Both teams were part of the American Association of Baseball Clubs, a professional baseball league. Although he didn't play in the MLB, his contribution shouldn't be overlooked. Number 35, Gremlins. In 1984, Gremlins introduced the world to the Mogwai, a fictional species that appeared cute and harmless, but came with an important set of rules. Owners could not expose the creature to light, allow it to get wet, or most importantly, feed it after midnight. Predictably, these three rules are broken over the course of the film, unleashing reptilian gremlins on the town. The leader of the gremlins, and the film's main antagonist, is a gremlin with a mohawk named Stripe. Although, some fans would argue you on that name. Hey, look, that one's got a cute little stripe on its head. Some claim that the antagonist's name was once Spike, 
a misconception that can be found not only among Mandela Effect believers, but many merchandise listings featuring the character. <laughs> Number 34. Fruit Loops Fruit Loops are a staple of any cereal aisle, and of many kids' breakfasts also some adults. But what if we told you there isn't any fruit in Fruit Loops? Say what? Well, obviously there isn't any in the cereal itself, it's pure sugar. But we're talking about the name. The fruit in Fruit Loops is spelled with two O's, instead of like one of the essential food groups. Naturally, this is to make it a more distinct brand and mirror the Loops part of the name even more. Yet plenty of us remember it being spelled like any other fruit. Follow your nose, wherever it goes, hopefully to the truth. Number 33, DX riding a tank. Who didn't love that mental image of D-Generation X invading WCW territory while riding on a tank? Wait, what do you mean that never happened? We clearly remember Triple H and crew driving into WCW Monday Nitro on that impressive piece of army equipment. Well, no, it was actually just a Jeep with a turret attached, but it sure looked like a tank from a side profile, right? Right? Oh well, maybe it's a bit more fun to remember DX riding a giant tank, but the truth is that this example of a Mandela effect affected many wrestling fans over the years, so at least we're not alone. Number 32, Martin Luther King Jr.'s murder weapon. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. The 60s featured several high-profile assassinations of public figures. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of these. The civil rights movement leader was killed from long range by a rifle while standing on the balcony of his hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee. However, as well known as the killing is, some remember it happening differently. At first I thought it was firecrackers. There are some who recall King being shot amid a crowd by someone with a handgun. Several famous individuals have been killed in this manner, so it's possible that King's assassination is being confused for one of theirs in people's minds. Number 31. Where are those hi-ho dwarfs going? Okay, get ready, because we're about to blow your mind. Or at least the part that grew up watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. One of the most popular songs from the classic Disney film is Hi Ho, sung by those seven little men holding on to their work gear. Hi Ho! Hi Ho! But you know the part in the chorus where they sing Hi Ho, Hi Ho, It's Off to Work We Go? Turns out you may not know that part quite as well as you think, because the actual lyrics are almost the exact opposite. Rather than hi-hoing to work, the dwarfs are hi-hoing home from work. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's home from work we go. Mind blown, right? Number 30, The Shining. Honey, I'm home is a popular phrase utilized throughout pop culture in family films, sitcoms, and even songs. Hi, I'm home and have a day. The line is turned on its head in The Shining when Jack Torrance says it prior to breaking through the bathroom door with an axe. Or at least it would be if Jack actually said it. Wendy, I'm home. A number of people online seem to remember the line being a direct riff on the typically cheery phrase. But in reality, Jack actually says, Wendy, I'm home, using his wife's name rather than the generic honey. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Number 29, Ho oh No, Pokemon. Ash's first adventure with Pikachu in both the original series and movie adaptations is capped off with the appearance of the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh, a bird of such splendor and gravitas that it is truly unmistakable, especially with that rainbow motif it likes to flaunt around. Unless, of course, you happen to think it was a Moltres? Yeah, there are a few fans who recall seeing the Firebird cross Ash's path as opposed to its feathered counterpart. We're not sure if this is just Gen 1 purist talk, but it's hard to mistake Ho-Oh's hairdo. Maybe fans just got it confused with James? A flame that lights the night, a flame that shatters the darkness. I am a flaming Moltres! <laughs> Number 28, The Lindbergh Baby. Famously referred to as the crime of the century, in 1932, famous aviator Charles Lindbergh's son was kidnapped. After several months, the body was found in the woods. And two years later, the ransom money was traced to a carpenter named Richard Hauptmann. 
While Hauptmann's guilt or innocence has been debated in the years since, there are still those who recall the facts of the case differently, namely that the Lindbergh baby was never found at all. The boy's disappearance remained a greater mystery than history recorded, at least according to them. Almost confessed to the Lindbergh kidnapping. They caught that guy. Number 27. John Lennon's Imagine Suit After the dissolution of the Beatles, John Lennon put out some incredible hits on his own. One of these was the song Imagine, which also had a film created around it. Imagine all the people. Many people remember Lennon wearing a white suit in the film. But going back to the movie now shows Lennon wearing a black suit with little crosses on it. It's easy to see why there might be confusion. After all, the house in the video is white, and Yoko Ono is wearing white. So why wouldn't Lennon be wearing white too? On the bright side, our sparse white living room looks like the John Lennon Yoko Ono Imagine living room. Or maybe people are remembering his wardrobe from the Abbey Road album cover. Then again, what if reality has changed? Imagine. Number 26. Obi-Wan doesn't say may the force be with you. Star Wars Episode 4: A New Hope May the force be with you has become a slogan for Star Wars over the years, with the date May the 4th even being used as a day to celebrate the franchise. Many believe that this phrase was initially spoken by Obi-Wan in the 1977 film, but this is actually not the case. In the film now known as A New Hope, Obi-Wan tells Luke, The force will be with you, always rather than the now universally known phrase. It may seem like an issue of semantics, but for some, this can be seen as an earth-shattering revelation. Use the force, Luke. For those curious, the actual first use of the phrase was by General Dodonna before the Death Star battle in the same film. Then man your ships, and may the force be with you. It is then repeated by Han Solo. May the force be with you. Number 25. How does We Are the Champions end? Sounds like a silly question, right? But you may be surprised to find out that it ends a little differently than you think. The classic rock tune finishes on a high, with Freddie Mercury belting out, no time for losers cause we are the champions. But if you find yourself asking, isn't there an of the world at the end there? You wouldn't be alone. Although you would also be wrong because the actual song concludes just like that. However, it seems Freddie also felt like something was missing, as he threw in an Of The World coda during the 1985 Live Aid concert. Of the world. That could explain why this false ending has become our ingrained recollection of the track. Number 24, the Air Jordan logo. Tell me I can no longer fly. I don't want you to. The logo for this sneaker line is one of the most iconic in history. Some believe or assume the logo silhouette is inspired and based on a slam dunk Michael Jordan pulled off from the free throw line during the NBA dunk contest in 1988. Well, the crowd lets you know what they think of it. Now we will wait for the judges. A 48 ties, a 49 win. However, the truth of the matter is far less exciting. We hate to break it to you, but the inspiration behind the logo isn't from that iconic Jordan dunk. In fact, the silhouette is actually from a Nike photo shoot, where one of the shots captured Jordan jumping in a position we can now see on the logo. At least it's still a cool shot though. Number 23, Macintosh apples. Macintosh apples were once one of the most prevalent types of apples out there. It's a little bit crisp, and it has a very fresh taste. However, their popularity has waned of late. Their name lives on due to Apple, the tech company, naming one of their most famous computers and many other products after them. Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Except they don't spell Macintosh the same. How? The fruits start with MC, while the computers start with MAC. Maybe Apple was right. What if we're living in a 1984 nightmare where conformity is enforced and truth is overwritten by our unseen overlords? Or maybe because they sound the same, we all assume they're spelled the same. Equally possible. We shall prevail. Number 22, C-3PO's Silver Leg, Star Wars The Original Trilogy. 
When you think of what color C-3PO is, what do you think of? Gold, right? Well, you'd be half right. Some may be surprised to learn that Luke's neurotic droid actually has one silver leg in the original trilogy. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. Many fans remember the character as being fully gold, to the point that some even believe his colors must have been edited in one of the many re-releases of the films. Even some official merchandise neglects to color his legs correctly. According to actor Anthony Daniels, however, C-3PO has always had mismatched legs. Where am I? I must have taken a bad step. It may be a Mandela effect, but it's more likely that this pervasive misconception is due to the silver leg reflecting the character's otherwise gold body, thus appearing gold itself. They're madmen. They're heading for the prison level. If you hurry, you might catch them. Number 21. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Your childhood might not look the same after this. As we all know good and well, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood always began with its titular host singing its theme song. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. This much is true, but that well-known opening line, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, not so much. Although it doesn't scan quite as well, it's actually a beautiful day in this neighborhood. But how did we all miss this when we've heard the song so, so many times in our youth? It's one hell of a day in my neighborhood. A hell of a day for a neighbor. It could be worse, we suppose. It's not like he was wearing leather jackets instead of cardigan sweaters this whole time. Number 20. The Monopoly Man's Monocle The board game Monopoly features a memorable mascot named Rich Uncle Pennybags, also known as the Monopoly Man or Mr. Monopoly. He's famous for his suit, top hat, and large mustache. However, people are divided on whether or not he wears a monocle. Reality seems to favor that he doesn't, but our memories of this childhood game can't be false, right? Ace Ventura, pet detective, and you must be the Monopoly guy. Heck, even Ace Ventura made the mistake, and he seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders. Could it be as simple as conflating the Monopoly man with other rich fat cat mascots like Mr. Peanut? Or has someone bought up all our memories? <laughs> Number 19. Sex in the City This much-loved HBO show and subsequent movies follow a group of four women and their love lives in New York City. I didn't feel a thing. It was like, hey babe, gotta go, catch you later. And I completely forgot about him after that. But are you sure that that isn't just because he didn't call you? However, strangely, there is some disagreement on what its title is. Although some would swear up and down it's called Sex in the City, its title is actually Sex and the City. Now, the easy explanation is that people tend to slur the word and a lot, so that sex and the city becomes sex in the city. Really? However, there also seems to be plenty of merch and newspaper headlines bearing the word in instead of and, so what gives? Did reality go out for too many drinks with the girls? Number 18. Fruit of the Loom's Logo Fruit of the Loom is a clothing company renowned the world over. Its logo is similarly famous, showing fruit spilling out of a cornucopia. Or at least, that's what many of us remember it as being. In fact, the logo doesn't contain a cornucopia at all. Okay, so maybe an old logo has it, right? Nope! Versions of the logo dating back over 100 years lack the cornucopia too. So why do so many people associate a cornucopia with Fruit of the Loom? Even parodies and references to the Fruit of the Loom logo contain cornucopias, but not the genuine article. Number 17. Lucy has some splainin' to do. I Love Lucy is a classic sitcom and among the most influential TV shows of all time. It's Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Rick. Now, what's going on here? Why'd you slam the door in their face? Well, Lucy's husband on the show, Ricky Ricardo, played by real-life husband Desi Arnaz, had a particularly memorable catchphrase. Lucy, you've got some splaining to do. Or did he? Lucy, you got some splaining to do! While Ricky frequently said the word splain in various contexts, he never says this exact quote despite the supposed line being cited all over pop culture. Lucy, you got some splitting to do. <laughs> it could just be a summation of Ricky's frustration with Lucy's antics distilled into a catchphrase that never was. Number 16. Oscar Mayer versus Oscar Mayer An American meat company, Oscar Mayer has remained a fixture of pop culture thanks to its recognizable logo, famous Wienermobile, and several catchy jingles. But its name is a source of some consternation, as a lot of people remember Meyer being spelled with an E instead of an A. Oh, I wish I were an Oscar Meyer wiener.
That is what I truly like to be. Old news clippings can even be seen spelling it M-E-Y-E-R. So is it just a case of the alternate spelling being more common leading to misspellings? My baloney has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. My baloney has a second name. It's M-A-Y-E-R. You'd think with one of its jingles having lyrics literally spelling out the company's name, though, it would be impossible to get it wrong. But there are those who swear the lyrics have changed since they were younger. Number 15. Sally Field's Oscar Speech Sally Field is a storied actress who's won many awards. Well, I can fix you some breakfast if you like, but after that you got to go. However, her acceptance speech for Best Actress for Places in the Heart is particularly memorable. Field famously said, You like me, you really like me. Or at least that's what everyone remembers, including the dozens of movies and TV shows that parody the moment. But in the real speech, Field actually says, And I can't deny the fact that you like me. Right now, you like me. It's likely that people who misquoted are just condensing the speech, but it seems uncanny that everyone seems to have gotten it wrong. You love me! You really love me! Field's brother Rick is a physicist at CERN, which of course has Mandela Effect conspiracists a buzz, given the Large Hadron Collider's relation to many theories about the phenomenon. You like me! You really like me! Number 14. Mirror Mirror on the Wall in this seminal Disney animated film, the villainously vain queen famously possesses a magic mirror. To call on it, she says mirror mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all. Except that's not the line in the Disney movie. Magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? In Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the queen says magic mirror on the wall. This is a strange case because the original fairy tale has her say mirror mirror, it's just the Disney version that's different. Mirror, mirror on the wall, is this not the most perfect kingdom of them all? This could simply be a case where people are conflating the fairy tale and the Disney film, but even so, it's odd that something as popular and well-known as Snow White wouldn't be better remembered. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Number 13, Curious George's Tale. Curious George is a monkey and the star of many children's books and television series. <laughs> hey, George! Perfect kite flying weather, huh? Given how long the character's been around, many are surprised to realize that he doesn't have a tail. After all, George is a monkey, and most monkeys have tails. Apes generally don't, by the way, and Curious George is repeatedly referred to as a monkey. <laughs> Could the common confusion between the two sets of primates be the root of this Mandela effect? Or has reality changed the features of George's posterior? Whatever the case, we are certainly curious to find out. Number 12. Mona Lisa's Smile The Mona Lisa is arguably the most famous painting in the world, and has been discussed and dissected for half a millennium. From the strange phenomenon of her eyes appearing to follow you, to her enigmatic smile. However, for some, the latter is especially mysterious, since there are many who claim that she didn't used to be smiling at all. Granted, it might just be that those exposed to the painting at an early age got better at reading her expression. Still, that so many people could be confused about one of the most studied pieces of art ever made seems odd. Number 11. Hello, Clarice. When Dr. Hannibal Lecter greets Agent Clarice Starling from his cell, a lot of us remember him saying, Hello, Clarice, in that chilling tone. After all, that's the quote that everyone references all over pop culture. Good evening, Clarice. Yet, in reality, Dr. Lecter never says this quote in The Silence of the Lambs, even if he approximates it in the sequel. Is this Clarice? Well, hello, Clarice. He says good morning to her and even good evening, Clarice, but never that infamous quote. So, are people simply misquoting the film because hello works at all hours of the day? Or is there a more sinister explanation at work? Number 10. Pikachu's Tail Color the adorable yellow, red-cheeked Pikachu acts as the mascot to the massive multimedia Pokémon franchise. Pika, 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 pika. Pika. With its image plastered on practically everything Pokémon, you'd think that its features would be burned into the brains of generations of adults and kids alike. But there are those who are convinced that Pikachu's tail, like its ears, used to have black on the end. Because of this misconception, there are plenty of images available that feature Pikachu with a black tail, so that could be to blame. Pikachu! Pikachu! 
Or maybe people are remembering something they were into as kids and are surprised when they revisit it as adults. Number 9. Looney Tunes We're getting to some deep cuts now. Looney Tunes is a franchise of Warner Brothers cartoons dating back to the early days of animation. Its characters are iconic to the medium and are practically as well known as those by rivals like Disney. Watch up, Doc! But as famous as Looney Tunes is, there are some who believe its name's spelling is no longer the same. Some people remember its name as being Toons, T O O N S, as in cartoons, while the current spelling appears to be Toons, T U N E S, as in a synonym for music. Oh, you twetuous twixter! The fact that its sister series is called Merry Melodies lends some weight to the musical spelling, and the fact that the words are homophones does mean confusion would be easy. Still, stranger things, right? Number 8. Tinkerbell Writing the Disney Logo Walt Disney's Disneyland When you wish upon a star Considering how big Disney is, they sure have a lot of us misremembering their properties. During a lot of Disney animated features, the introduction usually features the Disney logo, with its iconic castle and the name in distinctive loopy handwriting. However, many fans seem to recall the character Tinkerbell from Peter Pan appearing in these intros. No. <laughs> no. Although Tinkerbell has appeared in several variants of this sequence, a lot of us remember her using her wand to write out the word Disney before dotting the I with sparks. Despite many similar versions, none of them quite get it the way it's described. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I'll push the thing. Chalk this one up to magic? Number 7. Play It Again, Sam. As one of the titans of cinema, Casablanca has a host of memorable lines from He's looking at you, kid. to But what about us? We'll always have Paris. Yet one of its most quoted is never actually spoken in the movie. The line, Play It Again, Sam, a directive to the piano player to play as time goes by, is often associated with Humphrey Bogart's character Rick, yet he never says the words. Play it. Yes, boss. A few lines come close, but the exact phrase is not in the movie. It could be that in the pre-home video days, people just misremember the line. But still, you'd think a film buff like Woody Allen would know it, and he named a movie after a misquote. Number 6. Beam Me Up, Scotty. This line is as synonymous with Star Trek as Live Long and Prosper. It's just a little weird that no one in the show or films ever actually says it. Scotty, beam me up. Most often attributed to Captain Kirk, this exact phrase is not spoken by anyone in the franchise. Although, in fairness, similar wordings like the Voyage Home Scotty Beam Me Up were used from time to time. Well, beam me up, Slappy. <laughs> That's Scotty, sir. Ah, uh, geek test. Um, busted. <laughs> but why does this misattribution have the omnipresence of Q? Do people just like the sound of it? Did someone tamper with our timeline? Or did a transporter accident send some of us into a mirror universe? Number 5. Nelson Mandela's Death This is the memory that gives the Mandela effect its name. South African President Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison before being released in 1990. Or was he? A great number of people seem to remember Mandela dying in prison, and reading about this fact in textbooks or seeing it on the news. Even Mandela's actual death in 2013 from a respiratory infection did little to quell the uneasy feeling in people's minds that something about the world or their minds had been altered. Number 4. Life is Lack like a Box of Chocolates While sitting on a park bench and offering candy to strangers, Forrest Gump famously says that his mama always felt, quote, life was like a box of chocolates. It's an iconic phrase, but one we're likely all guilty of misremembering. Life is a box of chocolates, Forrest. You never know what you're gonna get. In fact, his mama, and thus our simple hero, said that, quote, life is a box of chocolates. It's perfectly plausible that people have merely altered the quote to be more general, and thus give it more currency, but it's still strange that we all get the most memorable line in the movie wrong. Life is like a box of chocolates. Mama doesn't say the quote like that in flashbacks. Number 3. Luke, I am your father. The immortal line is more mortal than you think. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. Everyone who's ever heard of Star Wars knows this quote. Yet in the actual film, Darth Vader says to Luke, No, I am your father. 
countless pop culture references and legions of dedicated Star Wars fans still manage to somehow get this quote wrong. You killed my father! No, Buzz. I am your father. No! So what's the deal? Have we all just misquoted it because Luke provides more context? Or have some of us come to this reality from far, far away? Number 2. Starring Sinbad, Shazam! Quick question, who starred in the 90s movie about a genie? I am Shazam! Some of us correctly recall it being NBA star Shaquille O'Neal, who had a sporadic movie career throughout the 90s. However, others believe the star of the film in question was the comedian and actor Sinbad, who starred in a number of children's films during that same time period. Racism! That's what Jesse Jackson was talking about! Others also believe this non-existent film starring Sinbad was called Shazam rather than Kazam, which they claim is something else entirely. Are people conflating multiple movies in their minds? If only we had a genie to magically solve this mystery. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. The Berenstein Bears You know that series of slightly saccharine children's books about a family of bears and the cartoons based off them? What were they called? The Berenstein Bears are remembered by many as part of their childhoods. However, they aren't the Berenstein Bears at all. They're the Berenstain Bears. The Berenstain Bears. The Berenstain Bears. The easy explanation is that names that end in Steen are far more common than those that end in Stain. And a lot of us were exposed to the stories as kids and misread or misheard the titles multiple times. Yeah. While some of us can shake it off, for others, this is a stain on reality. Which of these Mandela effects did you fall for? Let us know in the comments. You people have to learn how to behave yourselves in a court. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.